I'm really happy to introduce Jesus and Jorge because um, they've been around since the beginning. If I don't know if uh, if many of you others have been around, but I remember some of the, the I remember some of these early presentations. I think when this idea was uh, just uh, starting to form, and so I'm really really excited to see how far it's come, and really excited for for these guys to present to you, uh, especially because what we try to do here at the Ecosystem Foundry Working Group is to show products that are actually uh, in development that actually that are taking uh, that are making use of the technologies that we're talking about and actually implementing them and so uh, we'll just turn it over to these guys and and um, and, and please uh, ask questions I'm sure they would love uh, any questions and feedback so take it away guys oh well. thank right. you uh, yeah thank you Eric and Jorge can you share your screen please with our slides I will. Um, here you go. All right. Let's go. Okay. Great. So, folks, uh, oops, did we lose? Sorry. All right. Sorry about that. Yeah. Great. So I already introduced myself. My name is Jesus Torres, CEO of Entidad, and I'm here with Jorge Flores, our CTO. Uh, we first presented to the group back in August of 2020. Entidad was still in its infancy stages, but we believed that a digital trust ecosystem could help us address the plight of farm workers. And so we set off to build it. Uh, it's been a little over two years now, and we've learned a lot through our journey. So we thought this was a good time to check in with the group and, and provide a brief update. And so let's begin with uh, a little bit of background and who is Entidad, so Jorge. Um, yeah, so we're a Web3 technology services provider and we exist to help digitally transform mission-driven organizations uh, to scale their impact. What makes us different is that we come from the same communities that we hope to serve. We're the children of farm workers, we're immigrants, and we're also Stanford engineering alumni. And so we're drawing upon that unique perspective to build, a, to build technology that bridges access for these underserved communities. In fact, our story was recently uh, published in an article in Stanford Magazine, which is where that photo is from. If you're interested in learning more about our background, you can find it online at uh, stanfordmagazine.org. Uh, next slide, please, Jorge. And so uh, over the last two years, we've teamed up with leading farm workers serving organizations such as the historic UFW Labor Union, the UFW Foundation, and Cierto Global. And together, we're solving the problem facing traditional ways of engaging with farm workers. You see, most of these organizations were built to operate in an offline world through in-person visits to be able to safely collect and verify the sensitive information they, they need to be able to deliver their services. And because farm workers live and work in remote areas, scaling these types of operations is cost prohibitive and it keeps millions of farm workers across the country from accessing the services that they qualify for. But now that most farm workers have smartphones, we have an opportunity to reimagine how we deliver these services. And so into that began that work of reimagining service delivery with the first app that we launched. And Jorge, if you wouldn't mind switching over to the next slide here. And so early on in the pandemic, the United Farm Worker Foundation became a focal point for delivering aid and resources to farm worker communities. Uh, one of the grants they received was to distribute $100 grocery debit cards. Mm -hmm. The challenge with that was that for auditing and fraud prevention purposes, they needed to be able to collect some basic personal information. However, with the large crowds they were experiencing at the events and the need for contactless transactions, traditional pen and paper processes to collect data were not an option. And so with the help of the organization, sorry, yeah, let's go ahead, go to the next one now, okay. Yeah, and so with the help of the organization, uh, and through that began developing a solution. You know, we had a lot of questions in the beginning. How do we build technology for farm workers? And unfortunately, there's just not a lot of information out there uh, that we could uh, review or, or be guided by. So initially, it was a lot of trial by fire. We went through a lot of iterations, but in the end, the solution uh, we built helped the organization plan, manage, and operate over 500 resource distribution events that delivered 23 million in aid to over 40,000 families in the span of roughly 18 months. And so overall, we have a much better understanding of how to build technology for farm workers. And moving on to the next slide, Jorge. And since then, we've been able to build and launch three additional services. The first one was an immigration services solution that the organization is currently using to support its 
DACA renewal process since launching in May. It's already assisted over 200 cases. In September, Cierto Global, a nonprofit that provides uh, ethical labor solutions through the H2A visa program, launched its recruitment services solution, which is using the scale that's operation into Central and South America. And in January, uh, we will be launching our first truly multi-tenant service. So as part of the USDA's food and farm worker relief program that was announced in October of last year, the UFW Foundation and nine of its sister organizations were awarded a grant to distribute close to $100 million. Uh, the solution we've built will be used by all 10 organizations to be able to process applications and distribute benefits. Um, but as we transition from these singular apps to now kind of more of an ecosystem approach, we're identifying new challenges that we're still trying to solve for. So Jorge, if we can go to the next slide. And so some of the big ones include uh, connectivity. You know, it still remains an issue. Uh, farm workers live and work in remote locations. And so cell phone service is often spotty. And connecting to the internet, to the internet sorry, becomes, uh, it, it's, it's challenging. And so these are some of the things that we need to account for uh, when we're building our solutions. Uh, another one of the challenges is, you know, farm workers change phones uh, frequently. Uh, you know, we all upgrade our devices from time to time, uh, but with farm workers, this happens much more frequently. According to Cierto Global, uh, it's common for workers that they deal with to have up to three different phones in a six month period. Uh, they usually, you know, use pay as you go services. And so, you know, phones uh, often get switched. And so because devices are often being changed out, it makes it difficult to be able to anchor parts of our solution, such as identity to a specific device. And so, you know, kind of the question may be, well, what about anchoring to a phone number or an email address? Well, also, you know, because farm workers change devices often, they also change their phone number often. You know, they go from Mexico, Central America, the US, where they travel from state to state. And so, phone numbers often change as well. And unfortunately, when it comes to email, most farm workers don't use email. Uh, it's just a channel that they, you know, they don't feel comfortable using. And so they'll have one to kind of set up their phone and be able to download apps. That's about all that they use their email addresses for. And so kind of to solve some of these challenges and, and, and to tie this all together now that we're, we're, we're scaling up to a more of an ecosystem approach, uh, you know, we've, we're going to introduce uh, the next application, which I'll turn it over to Jorge to kind of take it over from here and present the, uh, how we're tying this all together. Thank you, Jesus. So tying it all together, learning from all of the good work that the digital decentralized ID and the trust over IP community have been putting together the, the standards, the protocols, the technology for us to really be able to deliver a privacy respecting experience. Now we're focused on the farm worker experience. So how they engage with services over the internet is really what we've been trying to work hard at solving that challenge. Um, so a few of the benefits of being able to provide a consistent, seamless experience for the farm worker to, to engage with any one of the trusted service providers. Um, and this is where the ecosystem plays, right? That there's a, a commonality in the types of interactions that they are encountering. They have to establish some type of relationship. Um, and I believe the, the term now is uh, it's being used here in the Trust of IP is an authentic connection, right? As we establish a connection from this digital agent to these organizations, uh, any exchange of information, any exchange of sensitive data, and keep in mind one important aspect, one additional challenge that we're trying to uh, work, work with is that a large swath of this demographic is undocumented, right? Um, and so because of that, there's an extra uh, sensitivity to respecting privacy, respecting the, the data privacy for, for, this, for these individuals. But this is really the intent that we, as we continue to grow our portfolio of, of applications, and as we introduce other uh, ecosystem participants that bring their own technology, because we're building on decentralized standards, that truly then we can achieve interoperability and collectively uh, these organizations, these service providers are bringing much needed aid, much needed service delivery to, to this important essential workforce. 
I'll stop for a minute. Any, any questions? All right. Yeah, uh, uh, actually, I, I do have a question. This, I, this is great stuff. So, I mean, I, I totally get the, the the notion of um, you know of privacy and trying to anchor you know an identity uh, up against these issues with you know, changing devices and you know lack of use of uh, you know consistent use of email and so forth. So, what I'm curious about is, are these just sort of um, um, recognized frictions in your process or are you looking at some interesting and novel ways of overcoming them? Um, I, I think that's a great question and, and probably I'll jump to the next slide so that we can kind of basically try to understand Entidad's perspective in our journey to not only building the technology, the apps on the right side of the slide, right? These, these are applications that Jesus uh, described that they're live, they're production. These organizations, they're pretty much living a firefight every day, right? They're, they have staff and volunteers that every day, their, their sole purpose is to bring much needed aid to, to this community. And we've been helping them, working with the UFW Foundation, Cierto, and then more recently, the, 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 the group of organizations that will be, that have been entrusted to deliver uh, pandemic relief in the form of $600 debit cards. Um, this is the USDA service that we're getting ready to launch uh, in January of 2023, right? So we, we're building this technology because these organizations have the need to bring their services uh, to this community in a world after the pandemic where we're now mostly virtual, mostly remote, in remote areas, et cetera. And so the, the challenge then becomes is, what is the digital experience for these farmer groups as they're trying to you know, find these resources and then in our, engage, right? Is that we don't, we don't want to deliver uh, a, a suite of, apps that they have to download from the app store, right? That would be confusing. One of the, one of the ch main challenges that we set out to solve initially was the passwordless login problem in that as our portfolio services grows, each one of these has to manage the app, you know, the farm workers uh, basically have, we have to manage access to these apps. That's the first problem. And we don't want to have to force farm workers to manage, you know, a collection of complex passwords. And then, um, you know, any, any viable application today that, that provides services over the public internet, you probably don't want to rely on username and password alone, right? You want to probably implement some kind of secondary or multi-factor authentication mechanism to ensure that the person trying to access the information behind the account is actually the, the intended the intended person, the, the holder of that information. And so we built all that, right? So as we are delivering this, these are some of the challenges that we're trying to solve in order for the farm worker to be able to find the services they need quickly and have a consistent experience. And so that's what the digital agent, the Preparase app, um, it's a native app. Jorge, I think we have a couple of questions. I think I see a couple yes. of hands up. Hi, yeah, thank you. This is, I, I think I might have asked this question in one of our earlier calls, but maybe um, to remind me or the, the rest of the, 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 the group here, because this is, uh, I mentioned this, these services are just so important and so valuable. And, 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 and it's wonderful that you're providing them or, or you know, providing access to these services. But how the, the question I have is why did you choose these you know, verifiable credentials and dids? Why did you choose this technology? You could if you could have built this with other technologies that are not these decentralized or these sort of web three, right? You might have been able to to uh, build some of these, these platforms or ecosystems previously based on other technologies. Why did you choose these technologies, or why did why did you um, decide this was the best path? I, I think that the most compelling story to, to, for this uh, around the decentralized identity uh, space is the peer-to-peer, -peer, the did-to-did 
uh, connectivity, right? The authentic connections, for one, is that, you know, when you have the mechanism to issue credentials, verifiable credentials, and establish peer DIDs, and those credentials and those DIDs are bound to a, a device, then you mm -hmm. solve the problem of having to identify the, the user, the, the, the holder, right? Mm -hmm. You no longer have to rely on, on um, phone numbers and email addresses, which by the way, in, in, today, in, in, today, uh, in today's world, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Those are, uh, there's just tons of opportunity if you're sharing your phone number and your email address with every service provider you're interacting, we all know the consequences, right? That there's right. there's data breaches, there's um, advertising schemes, and there's sale of your personal data. And so the right. ability for random actors out there to buy data and through your IP address or through your through your phone number be able to correlate your internet activity, we don't believe that that we don't want to be part of that um, mm -hmm. that part of practice, right? And right. so peer, peer dids and verifiable credentials and the cryptographic protocols that mm -hmm. protect the information being exchanged through those ensure right. that only the participants in those interactions are the, the ones that are you know exposing and sharing that data. And it's consent based, right? The the tap to tap to share. Mm -hmm. um, that's important. And the ability for us to string this all together to, to orchestrate and, and, and really because these are decentralized protocols, it's from a user experience is very important as well, right? If you, you've experienced the dance of accepting a connection or accepting a verifiable credential or presenting a verifiable credential, these things happen asynchronously because they're decentralized and that kind of introduces some friction from a user experience. So we also want to to, we've spent a lot of time trying to overcome some of those to make it transparent. The mm -hmm. fact that we're building on top of DIDs, the fact that we're building on top of verifiable credentials, mm -hmm. we're trying to make that seamless and transparent to the user so that they don't really care. At the end of the day, farm workers are just trying to access much needed Sorry. services and the organizations that are serving them are focused on delivering those, those services. Right. Yeah. yeah. I think I would just add, Eric, uh, you know, also for the verifiable credentials is we really want to be able to, you know, farm workers have challenges filling up forms. A lot of them uh, struggle with reading and writing. And so maybe, you know, as data gets collected and credentials and they get verified, you know, the farm worker no longer has to fill out forms over and over again when they're approaching each one of these organizations, right? right? They can share that information. And so it becomes just easier uh, to be able to access the services, you know, once you provide it, uh, establish a basic profile. Right, right. Great, thank you. So if it's okay with everybody, let's jump into a demo. Okay, so I mentioned, you know, just just touching on some of the challenges and, and points of friction, right? Passwordless logging is one example. So what we have here in our app is the ability to expose different services from different service providers. Um, and each service has its own basic policy, right? That they can enforce a DID or they can enforce a verifiable credential in order to gain access to the services. So uh, we have this digital ID demo service that kind of illustrates uh, the, 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 the solution for accessing a service securely. And so we, when a, when a farm worker first tries to access the service, here we present, okay, you want to access to the service, but you first let's establish a, tr a connection between the organization that's providing the service and, and you, the wallet holder. Um, so here I'll request a connection. And this is an example of, you know, the Aries spec, the, the connection invitation. So now we, we do want to uh, authenticate the individual at, at the service level. There's different service providers might have different rules for what they what they what they require to authenticate. So in this example, we'll verify either a phone number or an email address and and tie that to the connection. This way, we know that um, the individual is actually is a real person that we're talking to. So we go through here the process of verifying a phone number.
So once we verify the phone number, then you know we issue we offer a credential. And here's the credential. Um, in order to gain access to the apps, all we need to do is present uh, a digital ID. Really, this is just a, a, a peer did, right? The peer did, it's just represented being encapsulated in the form of verifiable credential. And then we attach a role, a user role. And this is, this is important for us to be able to present the right functionality when they access these applications to the user so that they have the right experience. Um, so I'll accept the credential. All right. And so now we have the credential. And now the idea is, okay, well, if you're a staffer or a volunteer on a desktop, it's, you know, when you're working from the ledger of your home or your office, you're most likely going to access the application from a, from a desktop. And so the experience to access, oh, here we go. So I'm going to do this from, from my phone because I don't have access to the scanner from the emulator, but, but I'll do the mobile, mobile access so you can understand what that's like. Is that this is just a, you know, a, a proof presentation request that if, if you have the right credential uh, on the wallet, you can scan this QR code and you're asked to present your, your digital ID and your role. And then you you present that, you share the information and you're, you get access to, to the app. So, so here's the, the demonstration for being able to access a, a, a desktop application with your signing credential. If you're gonna do that from your mobile device, this is where it gets a little tricky, at least with, with the, the choice that we, that we implemented, the, the proof presentation request. Um, what we, because there's a dance, right? You gotta bounce between the wallet and the app. So what we decided to do was implement uh, a, a custom uh, DITCOM uh, message ex exchange. So what we do here, instead of doing the dance, we just pass an encrypted DITCOM message to to the to the app, and you're in that the 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 peer did allows the resolution of the credential, and then you're given access. Mm -hmm. So, so that's the passwordless login experience, and we have the ability to enable that with any one of the services that that we deploy. Mm -hmm. uh, you notice now that. Now that I've got the connection to this organization and I've got my credential to this organization, uh, my signing credential, now you're given access to additional services that, that I've unlocked. Mm -hmm. um, we have, you know, in, in the slide, we, we, we saw, we saw uh, DITCOM. There's other, other examples of, of how we use DITCOM. And one of those, one of the capabilities I'm most excited about because it truly provides that personal touch, that uh, personalized uh, engagement is the did chat and the video chat that are did enabled. So I'll bring this over here. So imagine I'm a, I'm a contact agent uh, and access to conversations that get created from the app. So we have a support feature. Um, if anybody has any questions or trouble with the app, um, so here we have a, a did enabled uh, chat experience where you see here, um, I just contact agent, I received, I see this message, and we see like I don't know any details about this individual other than I know because of the infrastructure that we've built that we're that we're working on that this message is coming from a person and that's because you know this person has a did that has been issued through our infrastructure so now we can engage um one interesting thing for us as we try to build these capabilities is that remember we're we're building capabilities 
that are being shared across not only our digital agent, but the apps that are production in, in active use today. So we, were, we, we have the ability to blend the experiences. So this particular capability is interesting because um, we have the ability to bring in uh, Web2 kind of experiences uh, with it. So in this example, uh, we can bring in multi -part multiple participants into a, a thread. It could be another agent, it could be a, a, another staff, staffer. It could be a, a family member. Uh, and so here, for example, if I bring in um, an SMS number, we can we can incorporate an SMS participant into the same conversation. I think it's probably it's a refresh. And, and so I think that, so this is important for us because, you know, we can deploy this capability while we're still not quite ready to deploy the digital agent, the same capabilities we're able to incorporate into the apps um, that are live and, and operational. Um, an another example of, of, of DITCOM uh, message ex exchange, it would be the ability for us to you know, create a conversation and then share a, a conversation through a private invitation. Uh, for this this example, Jesus, can you do us a favor of scanning this QR code with your Preparase app? So, so with this with this uh, with this framework, we have the ability to have WebRTC uh, engagement, and so this WebRTC session is did enabled. Hey, Jesus. Hello. <laughs> okay. okay, so that's our. Uh, did chat and and video chat. Um, we also have a document service. There's a basically a, a document bolt is what we call it, and this is something that's going to be very common for farm workers, right? It's very common for them to have to exchange proof of their identity, proof of employment, proof of immigration status. And so managing their documents, uh, we believe that this is going to be kind of a very core service. Um, in this example, it's also um, protected, meaning that it requires some additional information in order to gain access to the service. So are you a farm worker or not? Um, this will be important because, you know, in the zero knowledge transfer, uh, zero knowledge proof capability, the ability for a farm worker through a simple uh, exchange of a verifiable credential. Are you a farm worker or not? And that having that presentation be verifiable, that's going to be tremendous for uh, farm workers to be able to receive services. Could be a discount at a local Walmart, for example. Um, and you know that could be a, a important uh, important feature. So what I'm going through now here is, you know, again, a similar experience to provisioning or uh, a credential. In this case, this is the second credential that we're working with. We're at this point, we're, we've only got two credential types and, and this one would be the uh, digital ID. So the digital ID, the, the purpose behind this one is for it to serve as a reliable means for the farm worker to identify themselves to their trusted service providers. This could be an example of this, could be a farm worker uh, shows up to an emergency relief event for uh, a free meal, or it could be a, 
you know, a, a holiday gift exchange, et cetera. And, you know, through simply being able to present their credential, there's no need to request any other type of doc documentation. Just, just show up and get your good and you're, uh, you're on your merry way. Um, some interesting things that we're still trying to explore uh, are, you know, visual cues. I think this is important. Uh, these indicators are, is this a self-attested um, a claim or is it a verified claim? Um, the non-creds uh, standard or protocol that this, these, these things are being built on, I think don't quite support that, but um, I uh, attended a presentation last week on the DIF, uh, the Decentralized Identity Foundation on the, uh, what's it called, the uh, uh, overlays architecture. And it seems like that might be a good way to incorporate semantics into OCA. the thing. OCA, yes, over, overlays capture architecture. The reason right. for that is, um, you know, uh, our app is multi-language. Today we're supporting English and Spanish, but, you know, farm workers most likely, you know, many of them speak Spanish. Uh, there are other languages as well. Uh, uh, but, you know, when you're presenting credentials, uh, or when you're being offered credentials, being able to present those credentials and the claims around those in the language, in your language is important. And so this is another thing that we've been trying to, we, we, we were working around this because the actual spec doesn't really support this. And so this, again, this is the example where I think the overlays capture architecture may be an interesting um, right. mechanism to solve for this. Jorge, I think we have a question from Judith. So this is all great. I think what you're working on is fabulous. Um, my question has to do with uh, when you earlier in the in the demo, you did something where it's like, oh, we're we're using this background so that we don't have to do the dance, um, yeah. which is so hard on a mobile device, which actually caused me challenges on a mobile device when I was trying to download, and all I had was a mobile device. So that's really great. But earlier in your thing, you said uh, that people don't have phone number, they don't have email address, these are challenges. But the very initial thing you did to enable all this was authenticate against a phone number or an email address. Um, and so, and, and that they change their phones often. So is the, are the credentials uh, cloud hosted? Is this a cloud hosted wallet with an app that's connecting to it. So when they get each new device, they can still connect out. I'm a little confused on how yeah. that works. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a good point, uh, Judith. I, I neglected to describe an essential aspect of the architecture for us is that there's a custodial wallet, right? In, in our, um, the, the wallet that we described that's embedded in our app, this is really a custodial wallet. And the reason for that, I think that there are many reasons for this choice, but the the three most important are that, you know, farm workers, like as was explaining, they rotate phones quite frequently. And so uh, the other one is that uh, a phone is often shared amongst the household. So, you know, the farm worker, a 60 year old farm worker might rely on his daughter, college educated daughter to, um, act on his behalf, uh, right? And so sharing phones is, 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 is quite common. And then, um, uh, so primarily the, the fact that we're verifying a phone, you know, this is a demo, right? So we, in, in certain situations, we will need to bind to a phone or an email address because we'll need another way of, we, we believe, although we haven't solved for it, is wallet recovery, right? That if if you lose your phone uh, and you, you obtain a new phone, you try to come back, you wanna be able to recover your wallet. Well, how do we do that if we don't have a, 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 a sure way of identifying who you are? So this is a problem we're still trying to solve. We haven't solved for it. Um, uh, one um, alternative could be biometric binding. I'm seeing a lot of traction on that front, but there are you know, ethical and, and moral questions around, around that as well. So 
you know, th those are things we're still trying to kind of work through. Thank you. That and and this is the challenge I always see with not just your application with others as well. It's like, okay, well, everything's working great, and then we default back to username and password to recover. You know, it's like so. It's it's yeah. like chicken and yeah. egg. Yeah. Now the thing here uh, to keep in mind is that that phone number it won't be used for any purposes other than you know to to be able to for compliance reasons say it is this is coming from a real person but it's you know it's protected it's encrypted so it's not the idea like you know the phone number is going to going to be shared and it's it doesn't become the primary vehicle for engaging so i think that's a key difference right and therefore, uh, it could be any random number, right? It could be any. It it could, like, like at the at the end of the day, what we need is a reliable way to. If, if you lose your wallet, Judith, and you come back and say, hey, "I want to recover my wallet," right? We just need a reliable way. Uh, we don't know that, and I believe this this is a challenge that everybody everybody in this space is trying to solve, right? Like, what's the best way to to, to solve for that? Thank you. Yeah, and I think we have a question from Supra as well. Sorry, uh, I muted myself. Uh, so I had a quick question. I didn't want to interrupt the flow of your presentation because I don't know if you're almost done or not. But <clears throat> I, I guess somewhat related to what Judith was uh, talking about, I was wondering if the if the process flow is something that is, you know, readily understood or you know, accepted by the audience, right? Because it, it, it could be fairly clumsy to, to initially deal with. So yeah. that was sort of one user interface related question. And, and the other <clears throat> somewhat unrelated issue was, uh, and this is a vague question because I'm not sure exactly how you're integrating the web two and the, and the did based services, but, but does that, lead to any uh, security or privacy issues? Uh, I'm not, it's, so it's, it's a vague question because I don't quite know how you're doing the absorption of the web two services. Yeah. So stop there, yeah. Yeah, so at the end of the day, you know, what one of the, for Entidad, our strengths is integration and piecing together um disparate technology services right so we're relying on a collection of SaaS services that provide discrete capabilities so document management right we're providing an interface but we're using you know secure cloud services to store those documents securely um, the chat capability and the video chat that's being provided by a third-party SaaS service uh, called Twilio. And so what, what did come and what the did uh, specs is allowing us to do is to encrypt the exchange of the information required to access those, those services. And really, if you know, it acts as like a, a control plane, I think I like that term from, from, from Sam uh, and this field. It come really establishes the ability to, you know, establish a session but, but then it hands it off to the, to the software to facilitate the delivery of the service, whether that's a delivery of a message or a delivery of a video WebRTC session. Uh, I think that for the foreseeable future, until decentralization and decentralized protocols and, and more apps support decentralized apps, that this is gonna be probably, um, you know, where we find ourselves at least for Entidad we have to live in a kind of hybrid world, right? These web two services are operational today. They, you know, folks have to apply to these services. They have to be able to communicate with them through SMS, through email. That that's that's the reality. And so we're we're enabling those capabilities with DID and VC protocols, so that as we, you know, over time transition over to these, become more stable, more prevalent in, in the space that then there, there's less of a, of a opportunity for those emails uh, 
and those phone numbers to be, you know, inadvertently shared with unintended, unintended parties. Sure, thanks. And, and and the user interface issue is not a problem so far. Is that well, we've been piloting uh, the app for a little over a year with internal staff, uh, uh, staff and volunteers, but. <clears throat> We're only just now getting ready to start, you know, rolling some of these features out to, to farm workers. So we, we're also building a knowledge base, you know, preparacy.info, which farm workers will be able to go to, to, you know, learn more about this technology and be you know, kind of more like be informed about what's going on. Why, why is this important? So there's, and then there's training, et cetera, and things like that. Yeah, we're only just getting started and getting ready for um, exposing the, this particular experience, this app, to farm workers. Okay, great, perfect. Thanks a lot. Mm -hmm. Please go ahead. Yeah. I think that, that pretty much wraps up the demo. I don't know if anybody has any other questions. I have a question in some of your uh, sort of some of your uh, testing with with users are uh, I guess part of the uh, do they you know sometimes it's 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 new to everybody not just to farm workers but <laughs> the, the new a new uh, a new a new app a new way of doing things you get presented you know for the, for the first time we've all been presented with two-factor authentication for the first time with nobody preparing us for it and we just kind of have to go through it and figure it out yeah. so are what's the kind of feedback that you get from them do they understand do they are they hesitant to say uh, what does this mean present a credential or request a credential are you what kind of feedback are you getting there because also just this is, again this is something that the uh, that everybody's trying to solve is the ux and the ui so it'd be yeah. interesting to hear that yeah eric i think uh to your point it's 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 challenging and that's why it's taken a little over a year for us to actually get ready to uh, release this we you know we had to it's difficult to communicate some of these concepts and so you know we've really been relying on on sharing it with the organizations and then kind of having the organizations kind of distill it um and so you know, they're really helping us uh, kind of they're going to help us really tell the story when it comes to farm workers and so uh it's definitely a challenge i think there's a lot of work remains to be done there um and maybe we can come back and provide uh, some more details as, as to how that kind of plays out over time. Great, thank you. From a, I think you know one of the things we have heard uh, from staff, and it is a challenge in some of these protocols, right? Because they're decentralized, there's a bit of latency in these things happening, and so that's observable to the user. And so you know we're used to entering your password or clicking a button and things happening quickly. But with the presentation exchange of a verifiable credential, you know, there's a bit of a lag. And so we're, we're trying to present a user experience that is kind of, you know, uh, orchestrating or choreography, you know, there's a choreography of asynchronous protocols. And so like, that's why you see the spinning, you know, in progress thing, right? Because we're, we're uh, you know, there's some, some handshakes happening in, 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 in the, the layer three uh, that is causing the app to say, like, hey, just wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. And so some users get a little anxious about that. I think we have a question from Steve. Yeah, so it's kind of a similar question, but it's more uh, focused towards the, the, the services on the right-hand side of the slide you got up there. Have you had um, the opportunity to have conversations with them about integrating these new paradigms into their existing systems? Um, the truth is most of these organizations don't, you know, are using mostly Excel and those types of, of services for much of their business processes at the moment. And so, um, you know, we're, we're kind of building these services and we've built these services um, kind of, you know, over the last year and a half. And so um, with the vision that eventually we will be able to um, transition it all over to be completely decentralized in Web3. But for now, as Jorge mentioned, we're, we're kind of doing a, a hybrid approach. Uh, 
Right, I understand that. I guess my, my question, have you, have you actually had conversations with these to kind of let them know about what you're doing and to say, look, you know, what we'd really like to be able to do and kind of outline the architecture and, and this is how we kind of interface with your systems or have you gotten to that point yet? Yeah, no, I mean, they've, they've entrusted us to, uh, you know, kind of drive the technology vision. What is the one really leading that effort? And so, uh, yeah, he's had, you know, a lot of conversations kind of, you know, kind of walking them through where we just, that we want to go. Yeah, and, and, and I guess, yeah, so so my, my core question there is, I'm curious as to what kind of reception you've gotten to that. Because uh, usually, you know, when you have these conversations, the the, the parenthetical implication is, and you guys are going to need to change your systems, <laughs> right? And I'm just curious what, what sort of response you've gotten from, from that perspective. Yeah, it, it, it has been from day one, right? And to that, if you go back to that, that article that Jesus alluded to, kind of, it, it, this, it talks a little bit more how we got started. But the reason why we exist is because of the need for these organizations to be able to scale the service delivery. Um, and, and preparase is Spanish is Spanish for, you know, get ready or get prepared. And really what's been driving a lot of this technology investment from these organizations, they've entrusted us to build this, this stack, is uh, the, the prospect of large scale immigration reform, that there are active conversations and it's been kind of a political football for some time, but there is the anticipation, these organizations, the UFW Foundation especially, they advocate for worker rights. They advocate, they work closely with our legislators to bring, bring forth policy. And so um, we've been building for the anticipation of immigration reform, a path to citizenship to millions of farm workers and their families. And so to be able to provide services at that scale, one, um, we need to be able to embrace open source uh the the, the standard-based integrations and if that comes about then we have a stack that we've built that can be leveraged by multiple organizations a lot of these organizations that serve farm workers are regionally based but we we built these capabilities of our platform really is multi-tenant and it's plug and play so we have the ability to deploy these services for these organizations at the push of a button and that will help us deliver these services to more, more, more individuals than would have been possible if they continue to operate with the, the, the tools that they, that they use today, right? The, the quick bases of the world, the Excels, uh, Excel spreadsheets, the Google Sheets, et cetera. They just don't scale. And then from, a, from, a, from the perspective of the farm worker, again, right, is that if, if you're a seasonal farm worker, you might be working in California today, uh, tomorrow you might be in Georgia. Um, you're engaging with different service providers, but the information you're sharing with them is, is the same information. So if those service providers over time build on top of these, these protocols, they may choose to work with Entidad or they may choose to build work with their, their own uh, technology providers. But at the end of the day, this will facilitate a better experience for, for this user base. All right, thank you. I think we had another question from Judith. My question is, uh, are you uh, collaborating at all with the Ag Stack project at, um, at LF, at Linux Foundation? Not yet. Okay. Um, no, we, we have uh, started, at least personally, um, I was excited to learn about the, uh, the, the, the starting of the Open Wallet Foundation with the Linux Foundation. Mm -hmm. yep. And that's something we're very interested in participating in, in collaborating on. Um, we've been building this particular, our digital agent, we've been considering building with the prospect that we're gonna open source this as well. Okay. Oh, I might make an funny. introduction to you just because uh, there would be, you know, they're working on sl slightly different things, but some synergies, I think. Absolutely. Um, so and, and there is, you know, that possibility, right, that 
uh, farmers, the, the growers that are hiring the farm workers, they could be participants of this ecosystem as well. And that's one of the great things about what Trust Over IP is doing, right? It's a network of network effect. Right. Uh, that, uh, you know, that's where, we, you know, real value will come when we get, you know, other other organizations, entirely different, different contexts engaging with these users. Great. Well, um, the other the other um, thing I wanted to say is I don't know if anybody in your organization is working on the user experience side of things, but in January we're starting up a new group to work on the user experience patterns and and ceremonies so that they become. We're not going to recommend, hey, your your UI needs to look like this, but here are best practices, and so I think that your the target audience that you have yeah. is the type of target audience we need to have voice in in those ceremonies because you know they're they're switching phones they're doing things differently and that's really how we're going to have that problem in other communities as well and somehow the people who are designing the tech yeah sometimes forget that hey what? joe you know normal person doesn't understand a ceremony to scan a qr code on their mobile phone that, that's <laughs> like that, that's a great point judith and, and i want to i want to raise this i know we're out of time but it's an important one if you see here our credentials uh, oftentimes oftentimes you know when you show up to a, a an emergency relief event <laughs> to receive a free meal or cash assistance you just want to pull up your wallet and say hey i'm alicia right I, why do I have to scan your QR code? I'm, I'm, I have the credential. It's in my wallet. You scan my credential. Can you, you know, like, I don't know why it's like, it needs to be, okay. we don't have the ability to do that. Uh, I have to scan, I'm the wallet. I have to scan your QR code. Why, why can't it be the other way around? <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, that's, that's how it works in the physical world. I take out my driver's license and I show it to the librarian. Um, and so that, that's, that is a challenge. Exactly. Yeah. So I, I think that, um, we have our, our, our UX designer, uh, our product team, uh, and we'll probably ask them to, to, to see if they can start participating in, in those sessions once they start in that working group. That would be great. That would be honestly great. 